thank you, Zenovic, for this honor and opportunity given to me to interact with this distinguished audience. I am conscious of the richness of experience, knowledge, and wisdom present in this hall. I can see some seniors who are far more experienced and have greater insight in issues than I have. And I also see some young scholars who have appetite for deep dive. So I'm looking forward to taking something from here because essentially what we do at the JIC Joint Intelligence Committee is we prepare assessment on issues of national security for the benefit of the National Security Council, which comprises the Prime Minister assisted by the four ministers, Raksha Mantri, Green Mantri, Mr. Mantri, Videsh Mantri, assisted by the National Security Advisor. Today, we'll be talking about the Belt Road Initiative of China and what it means for us. I think I may not be wide off the mark if I say that this is one issue which has been talked about most in the citizen community in the recent times. Within this country, even externally. People have interpreted it differently. Is it economic initiative? Is it a strategic? Is it perhaps the mix of the two? Is it that the China believes that its time has come and it should realize its dream of being the Middle Kingdom? A lot of interpretations, a lot of writings have come up on this subject. What here I'm going to share with you is how do we look at it? What is our assessment of Belt and Road Initiative of China? And what it means for us? If we look at the BRI, at China's strategy for its comprehensive growth. And by comprehensive growth to me, economic, military, and political. We all know that this was launched in some in a, in a very, very uh, unrefined way, perhaps, in two installments by Chinese president in September and October 2013, when he launched Silk Road Economic Belt and Maritime Silk Route. Later, they Defined it, they called it one belt, one road. Further defined it, they called it Belt Road Initiative. And nowadays, they would like to call it Belt Road Initiative for International Cooperation. Now, was it launched in 2013? Publicly, yes. But did it begin there? Because when it comes to China, we all know that unlike many other countries, including ours, where we have, we first articulate a policy and then we go for its implementation. Chinese way is different. They don't publicly articulate their policy, especially their important policies. They take a decision, try to implement it, test it, and at the appropriate time, they make it public. 
take the case. 2015, Chinese published the document publicly stating that now they would have a maritime orientation of their PLA. And there was a lot of debate all over that well now China is going to be a great naval power. How the equation within the PLA, within the army, within the navy, and all that will will emerge because after all, PLA army has been in the preeminent wing of the PLA, and now they with the preeminent shifting to the navy, there will be internal dynamic, internal tensions and all. But look at the ground situation. China had begun building the maritime infrastructure assets across the world since the beginning of this century. 2005, of the top 50 container ports in the world, 10% of it were either owned by China or Chinese were heavily invested in them. Five years later, in 2010, from 10% it grew to 20%. And by 2015, they had almost 70% of the top 50 container ports were either owned by China or Chinese were heavily invested in them. 2016, they launched 19 naval warships. Between 2013 and 16, they lost five replenishment ships. Their policy became public in 2015, but the work had become long, long back, because after all, you can't do all these things over time. Well, they had built this, they had begun building the required industrial complex and reaching out well before they announced this, their policy. Take the case of CPEC. We have all been talking about it since May 2013 when Chinese announced it, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. But did it really begin then? It began in 2001, when in the nondescript port of Wadar, the 2001 when the Chinese Premier visited Pakistan and this particular piece of coast was given to a Chinese country to develop it. And they did that. Phase one of Wadar completed by 2006. As usual, they had marketed well. Pakistanis thought that perhaps it would be a, a, a bonanza for them, a commercial bonanza initially, or maybe they also, of course, they always thought that Chinese presence would always be a, to their advantage, you know, strategic advantage. But given them that so much of low burden Pakistan with the low, having completed the job by 2006, they left and. Singapore Port Authority, PSA, they stepped in. They were also this, 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 this. The idea of this Gwadar port being a commercially lucrative port, they also bought in, perhaps in their calculations, they thought that it might work, so they have to develop and operationalize it and keep it running. Soon they realized it was unsustainable. And by 2013, somehow they reeled out. And then the China Port Holding Company, the overseas Port Holding Company, took over. And it built it further and built it into a Chinese, into a Chinese asset. 2013, to make it, perhaps to give it some, some uh, more aspect to it, and also add economic aspect by building the connectivity and expanding it in a much broader way. Part of it, you can have a glimpse of it, you might have got. Or it was leaked in dawn. 
they started talking, but the foundation was laid long before. Hamlet Tota started in 2008. Chao Fu in Myanmar 2009. <coughs> Chicago, they tried when they were not getting it well. A little south at Sonadia, they started working in 2010. By 2012, Djibouti, they were already well established. Of course, 2016, they made it very clear that they would be building a their military base with about 10,000 soldiers. So, China makes its policy public much later. It begins working on it way before. Now the question is, if the strategy, if, if, if this entire initiative of reaching out is essentially a Chinese strategy for its comprehensive growth, then what was the need for launching this so-called One Belt, One Road or BRI in 2013? <coughs> yes. By 2010, they realized that their economy was thus the double-digit growth. That period was not sustained. They could see it. And that looked right. It went through a stagnation and then eventually <coughs> slide down to a single digit and further down. Now, at that point of time, they needed to create market, to create external demand, to absorb its industrial overcapacity, idle capital. And how do you create a market? How do you create a demand? The marketing strategy. And as a marketing strategy, they came up with the One Belt, One Road, Silk Road, all these things, and finally One Belt Road Initiative is a brand. It's a brand to aggressively push its agenda for comprehensive growth. They use all kinds of language for it. It's not a solo, it's a symphony. They, all choices, expressions they use. But essentially, BRI, which they made it public in 2013. They created a brand for the projects they were already doing, the policy, the strategy, which they were already pursuing, to give it an aggressive push because they realized that slowdown in the economy will create such a huge backlash, it will be difficult for them to sustain. It will create huge problems, unemployment, public unrest. So they had to create more, and so they created, through the marketing strategy, they created the grant, and they started pushing it ahead. And what happened in the middle last month when they created, when they had the event? It was nothing but a, 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 an event to promote the grant. Many people have written about India's part, non-participation because we choose to stay out. When everyone is have is free to have this view. But we did it for certain reasons, which I will come down later. Now, a stripped of its, you know, parache, it's, it's, it's all the glitter, the marketing glitter that goes with aggressive advertisement. What is there, it is essential. <coughs> How does China pursue its strategy for comprehensive growth? Let us look at it. First and foremost, China, we know that China as a state is the principal economic actor in China and abroad. And as a state actor, it abuses the free market economic order. 
because the underlying principle of a free market economy, as enunciated by Adam Smith, is, as you all know, that if the economic actors are free to pursue their, ins their incentive, their interest, that is profit, then the invisible hand of the market will ensure the best possible return for all. That is the axiom on which the free market economy is based. So an economic actor pursues its interest, which is profit, economic profit. But when a state becomes a predominant economic actor, a state actors are, a state's motives or interests are not merely economic profit. It has huge a strategic interest. And in pursuit of that a strategic interest, it doesn't mind absorbing huge losses here and there, wherever. It believes that the huge economic loss is amply compensated in a strategic gains. It will do that. But that's not the uh, case with a, a classical economic actor. So China's being part of this free market economy order, member of the WTO, we also were a very enthusiastic supporter of China being, being in that trend, has been abusing this free market order. What it does, it creates artificial demand. Because looking for dem creating demands market for <coughs> its product. So it creates artificial demand, a demand which may not be either the genuine or sustainable demand, or demand which is in the order of priority. A country needs a lot of things. Now when Pakistan Two existing ports, Kasi and uh, Karachi, were not operating even at their 50% capacity. Did it make any rational economic sense to have a third port? But it created a demand and it got into it. Sri Lanka, existing ports. Again, the same case. We're not working to their optimum capacity, but Amban Tota, a demand. They created a demand and started bought into it. And these countries, they bought into this. So it creates artificial demand and it steps into fulfilling those, those demands. And when it does a step in, it steps in on its own term. Please. Identification of the project, feasibility study of the project, cost determination of the project, and execution of it. All done by the Chinese, by and large. And when they execute the project, Is their company which will do the work, of course. <coughs> their capital. Capital includes fund, money, as well as materials. And to a significant extent, their labor. How does the host country benefit? Because when you, and all these are coming by your loan, it's not coming gratis, it's not coming as, uh, as something which is at a very highly concessional, unless if the project is strategic. When I need a project, I need a road to be built, and I approach a financial institution, we do the feasibility study and then work out what would be the cost of it. And when the financial institutions agree to build a loan, I move for a larger bidding and at least enlarging the canvas, a spectrum of the bidders. China doesn't allow that. 
and reluctantly it agrees to a limited tender. Limited tender means there will be a number of Chinese companies, among them you choose one. This is how China operates. And then when it gives the money, invariably it is giving now in Chinese currency yuan. Well, we all know that yuan is now in the SDR. But there are not, not many takers for it. So when you take loan in Chinese yuan, how do you repay it? For repaying, you need yuan. For that, you need to have a surplus trade. All the countries, I think maybe, I don't know if there is an exception, but they all have huge trade deficit with China. Means they import far more than they export. Take the case of Bangladesh. How many cases have many could have? We have about, in 2016, we have about 47.7 billion US dollar deficit. Bangladesh imports about 9 billion US dollar, exports about 700 million. That's the case with my job. So when you take loan in Iwan, you don't tell Iwan, you have to pay back in dollar. And who fixes the exchange rate between Iwan and dollar in the China? Now you run the risk exchange rate risk, which you are paying. Now it's a it's a very very convoluted and uh, very one-sided way of doing business. This is how it does business. This is how it has been pursuing its growth strategy, which it has renamed or branded like branded as Belt Road Initiative. It has expanded the basket. It called it in connectivity. It has gone beyond that. It also builds a special economic zones and so many other things. Now, if this is what BRI is, if it is, if, if it is a Chinese policy of comprehensive growth which has been pursuing for the last at least 15 is 16 years, which it has rebranded to give aggressive push at as BRI, then what it means for us? Of course, the first and foremost which we have emphatically articulated is our concern over CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and issue of sovereignty. That's the point which has been well emphasized. Beyond that, what? Look. It is aggressively pushing itself in our neighborhood. Nepal, Bangladesh, Burma, Sri Lanka, we are not, I'm not talking about Pakistan. And when it pushes inside these countries, how does it impact us? Our neighbors. It creates economic, political and security. That is the military dependencies of these countries over China. When they take, these countries take low in infrastructure building, and we all know that infrastructure by itself rarely pays its own cost. It is a, it's, it's a, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for growth. You build a road, a road doesn't pay, pay off its cost. You build a bridge, bridge doesn't pay off its cost. 
it creates, it is, it is, a, it is a creation and ecosystem. It stimulates, it is expected to stimulate activities which will lead to growth. But when these countries that take loan in these infrastructure, expensive loans, and not able to repay, these countries will get into what you call the trap. A clear example, as we see, is in Hamantota, Sri Lanka. A non-productive, useless, not required port. They created a demand, sold the demand. Of course, the country has to buy it. But the regime was such, the environment was such that they were able to sell it to the country. Then, then, then regime, uh, as a little regime. That look, this port is sitting right close to the east-west sea lines of communication. What a commercial bonanza it will have. Ships will be coming for servicing OTR towers. When it was built, they realized that hardly issue of visits. The built airport, Machala Airport, hardly one flight a day. These are not sustainable. So, when China is not, they, they just ask for the loan. Yes, return. And when Sri Lanka is not able to reach our return the loan, okay, in that case, do one thing. What you do, no, no, we first give the loan. And they strike it in, okay, fine, let the port be ours by having the majority stake. Now, they are expected to have about 80% of the equity in Amman Total. <coughs> Virtually, the port becomes a Chinese port. Similar is the case, is going to be the case even with work. But having even taken over the port, this is not enough. Because we got the port, we go get the equity we have taken, we have 80% of the loan, which you were not able to pay up the 80% of the loan we have taken up, ourselves absorbed it. But it's a dead investment. You need to give us access to some more land where we can build and do some more activity, commercial activity, which in turn will generate revenue. Revenue for you and revenue for us. Otherwise, it's for us, it's a dead investment. And then they are now struggling now, having for more large piece of land, doing all kinds of agreement uh, negotiations going on. So if you find countries' ability to take an independent decision is hugely compromised. Now take the case of Bangladesh. Where, I mean, there, one of the major projects where Chinese are in is Padma Multipurpose Bridge Project. It's about 3 billion plus. There has been cost escalation. Now, how Bangladesh is going to handle it is now in a fix. A number of infrastructure projects, if that's that apart. China also builds a sea jet. Then the special economic zone it builds in, in, in any of our neighbors, what does it mean to us? When an SEZ is built in Bangladesh, what it will do? China will shift its manufacturing, some of its relocate, some of its manufacturing industries here, especially the sunset industries, because China, the labor cost is going up. Goods are not as competitive because of the rising cost input. China doesn't have that preferential access to the market which least developed countries or the certain countries who qualify under WTO, they don't. So, China starts putting up industries in SCJD, Bangladesh. Well, they do it in, let's say, garment, 
RNG ready made garments and textile. Now, they produce the goods there in this AC jet. But Bangladesh market doesn't have the capacity to absorb it, not even a fraction of it. So, the, so the, those, those manufactured goods come over to us. And under WTO, you cannot have a discrimination regime, you can't stop. Because then the goods are produced in Bangladesh. Chinese are producing goods in Bangladesh, and those goods are accessing your market. There are certain sectors, especially textile and RNG. Bangladesh and India, we are, compet we are competing with each other. India also has about 40 million plus of <coughs> textile and RNG export. Now, the cheaper goods getting into Indian markets, which you cannot stop. Also, the European, external market, let us say European market. Bangladesh has GSP, what we call is um, generalized system preference, by under which they have preferential access to European market. India, we don't have. So as such, we have a disadvantage in competing with Bangladesh. Now, with the Chinese manufacturing these goods in Bangladesh, it not only it will flood our market, it affects our industries, but it also causes heavy export erosion. A lot of other goods, consumer goods, shoe, other uh, usables, consumables. So many things can be manufactured, and that impacts that hurts our economic interest. Now, they have signed an MOU with Nepal to build one SC jet right at our border at Damak. Now, if they set up an SC jet at Damak <coughs> and set up their manufacturing in industries, where would the goods go? The Nepal market doesn't have the capacity to absorb even a fraction of it. Eventually, it has to come. What eventually? It has to come to the market. And it is not illicit. It is illicit apart. It will come informally because we, under, we are under obligation. If the goods manufactured in Nepal, we cannot put so many restrictions on it coming to us. It is going to heavily damage our industries, our economy. China, we have, we have been talked, we have, I'm, because mostly we have been, cons, we have been uh, confined to a strategic aspect about military dimension of it, that's what I'm, and I believe there are not many experts here who, 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 are, who are far more, exp, far more experienced than I am, and I'm, I'm highlighting how the, it hurts even the economy us, which is very, very, very crucial. So, when China, under BRI, gets into our neighborhood, gets into all these activities, which hurts our economic interests, <coughs> which erodes our political influence vis-a-vis those countries, and also undermines our security. So what do we do? What should be our, what are the options that we have? There have been a lot of writings, a lot of people, experts have given opinion that we should have, we should not have stayed away from the show. Because 29 heads of the government and heads of state, they participated. More than 60 countries, they participated. Countries like United States of America, they also participated, though I've been critical of the China. Japan also, which has been okay, they also have participated. Why not you? You know, when they have created this kind of an advertisement, this kind of an aggressive publicity boom, all these countries look for a business opportunities here. Perhaps, maybe, 
there's videos. I'm not going into the details of various stated arms of the of Obo, especially the six areas where they are the China, Mongolia, the Russia corridor, China, Central West, Arab, Central Asia, uh, uh, West, uh, and, uh, Central Asia, West Asia corridor, BCIF. Then on the eastern, on the sort of Indo China. I'm not going into the, the specific, these are all immaterial. Then we are coming to the basic, basic of be alive, what it means to us. Whether it does project here or there, so far it's good for China. Is it good for us? It's not that we are <coughs> sinophobic. Yes, no. We like to engage with China but with our eyes open. If we join this bandwagon, then that means we endorse it. We say we approve it. However subdued our representation might be, we might end up just sulking that look, China is causing harm, but well, because so many countries went, everyone went, so we also had to send a delegation. We also participated, we also endorsed it. Now, when you, you endorse a project which, or an initiative, or a strategy, which hurts your interest so heavily, then your neighbors and your friends, if they let Chinese get into these countries and work. How do you tell them that this is not good? You should reconsider. Well, in any case, you know, every country will go by its own interest. And China will push it. Those countries, if they require it, they will take it. If they don't, they won't. But if we endorse it, it makes it far easier for all to go, for, to go along. Now, once we have taken a decision that no, BRI as a brand is not acceptable to us. As an individual product, yes, we are open to explore it. But as a brand, no, we don't accept it. Now, our neighbors and friends, with our this categorically stated position, certainly would not altogether ignore India's sensitivities. I don't say that this is going to harm the Belt Road Initiative of China or do them any kind of significant damage. We need to protect our own interest. And as an interest especially in our neighborhood. We cannot be seen as a chorus boy to a Chinese orchestra when we know that it hurts our interest. So better reject the brand rather than remaining ambivalent. So this was a very conscious decision because by going and joining, it hurts our interest. It would, it would damage our interest very badly. And we could report it. So we made it clear. Now, since we have stated and made our position clear, then, then we go from there. Yes, we need to build our own connectivity. First and foremost, our own internal within the country. Because before China began reaching out to the rest of the world, they created their own internal connectivity. All over, we all know how much, even in the Parkland areas, what kind of infrastructure they have built. So having built the connectivity, they reached out. Today, we are quite efficient, and we have to do that. On the land, as well as along the coast. And under various projects, it's going on. Like on the land, a lot of, of course, the more we are aware of how much the service transport minister is doing it. And along 
the course under Project Sagar Malab, we are building a chain of this type of uh, ops. That's not enough. At the end, uh, side by side, we also have to build the regional connectivity. In, those, in the country, after all, your neighbors will need infrastructure. Can we do something to help them? Our own assessment is that if we get into it, we can do the project in less than 50% of the cost which China charges. Of course, the experts say that no, it is far less, it will be doing in about 30%, but given margin. Take the case of North Carolina power plant, how the Chinese they do it. It's a 900 megawatt project in, I mean, in Sri Lanka. They pegged it at 1.2 or 1.25 or so billion dollar. Actual cost is less than nine. Actual, not that the actual cost it came, but in the deal, though the stated cost was, is 1.25 billion, the cost is 900 million. The 30 percent of it has gone as kickback. And when. Sri Lanka is not able to repay and say that you take equity. Then the Chinese say equity is not for 1.25 billion. <laughs> because they know that the process is not worth 1.25 billion. It is only 900 billion. They have now they are in trouble. Sri Lankans are in trouble. Now Chinese way of doing business is very, very mercantile. They do a straight for king. Now we believe that we can do the project in a much on a much lesser, uh, uh, lesser cost. <coughs> and we can help them get what they want. If necessary, of course, with the help of, we don't have that much of capital. Maybe we can, we can uh, do it in collaboration with our friends. Recently, in the Africa Summit, Prime Minister talked about Asia Africa corridor, the growth corridor. But did that? workable <coughs> concepts and we can work. So while we take a position on it, we say that okay, on your specific project we are open. It's not that we say that we are hostile to you. Many people say that many many of the experts wrote that India by staying away is incurring the wrath of mighty China. It is a it is a hostile act. Some of our experts also go to the extent of saying that this is a pet project of Chinese President Xi. So much used we are to individuals and leaders. Xi might might have articulated it. The project began 15 years back. To say that this, if you don't, then you are you are you, you are incurring the displeasure of the king, the Chinese king. What kind of notion we are trying to? We propagate. We have made our position clear, Kategorica. We need, uh, and when we say that we will examine the product, there is one product on which we are engaged, BCIA. We have not, not said no. Recently, only we held a joint meeting in, in uh, Kolkata. We will see. If it is good for us, we will go for it. If it is not, fine. Maritime capability we have to build, of course, because after all, maritime both commercial as well as naval. We have a lot of, I mean, a lot of distance to cover. We have certain natural advantages. Our island chains on the east and the west, and Mali, Kubar, Lakshmi. We have never looked at them as our strategic asset. We are looking at them. There are many ways by which India's story will go on. Because I, I don't believe, and I don't think any of us in our right mind should believe that India can be isolated or alienated in the globe. 
in the world, in the, in, in the community of nations, because the given our economic and political health, no, no country can afford to go to that extent. All that we need to do is we are not hostile to anyone. Like anyone else, we like to protect our interest. And we should we take a, a clinical look at any initiative. If it is good for us, we'll go for it. Whether it comes from China, it comes from Japan. But we will not be swayed simply because there is a so-called emerging superpower is trying to intimidate the people around. We cannot be intimidated. Well, I think uh, broadly I have tried to make my point. I will be very happy to benefit from your views. Your <laughs> Yeah, but that's what it does.